You may have heard the story. It's an old story about uh, a turtle and a rabbit. Uh, yeah. Sound vaguely familiar? Yes. All right, so the rabbit's making fun of the turtle for being so slow, showing how fast he can run. They have a race. The turtle says, I'm going to challenge you to a race. The bunny takes off like a dart, gets so far ahead, and then takes a nap, maybe gets a little bit distracted, never quite makes it to the finish line. Meanwhile, the turtle slowly, steadily makes his way and wins the race. Um, if you talk to my wife, you will find out that that's sort of a description of who we are. I am much like a rabbit, where I take off like a dart, uh, but I don't always finish the task at hand. I kind of get distracted, and a little ADD, a little bit of a squirrel. Um, those sort of moments pop up for me quite often. Um, and uh, Christina is a, is a steady person who kind of gets things done well. Um, and it got me thinking that it's one thing to start off uh, in a direction really well. Like, there is, there's great things to having like moments of clarity and going, oh, this is where I need to go and I'm gonna start in this direction. Um, and it's another thing to keep that momentum going. And I don't know about you, but I have a hard time with the second part, the keeping it going uh, part. I don't know if it's distraction or uh, laziness or what, but I, I really admire people who are steady goers. Um, today we're gonna look at uh, the last chapter of Nehemiah, we're wrapping up this, this series, and um, <clears throat> it's, it's a really cool chapter, and, and I have to explain to you kind of what's gone on before. Um, it's chapter 13, but uh, Nehemiah heard that things were bad in Jerusalem, he needed to go uh, back, and they started this project to rebuild the wall, and all along for the last eight or so weeks, we've talked about um, how similar that is to building up our lives, and to building a good life, and building a good community. And um, so Nehemiah goes back and he, he rebuilds the wall. And finally the walls are up and the people are safe. They're able to start thriving. They no longer have to walk around waiting to figure out when they're going to get attacked. Um, and so they kind of begin to settle in a little bit. And then they have this incredible encounter with God. They, they read the book of the law. They um, go, wow, this is amazing stuff. They commit themselves to the Lord. And they have this like jump start in their spiritual life. Um, and this uh, story feels very similar to my own. Um, I kind of went about doing life as, as I saw fit, as uh, I was trying to make good decisions. Um, but I kind of ended up in, in not so good places. I found myself getting more and more enveloped by um, depression and by um, substance abuse and, and things that were just sucking my life away. And then um, it got bad enough that I decided I needed to go to church um, well, I needed to call a girl that was really pretty, actually, who seemed to have her life more together than me. That's really the honest truth. Um, and she said, you should come to church with me, and so I went. Um, and then the youth pastor at that church said, hey, how about you read the book of John and tell me what you think? Um, because I didn't have a clue if God was there. And in the process of reading the book of John, I came to encounter this person named Jesus who loved me and realized this was um, my story, too. And... Um, I had a ton of spiritual momentum at that moment, and as we kind of dive into the lives of these folks in Jerusalem, that's what they had. They had a ton of spiritual momentum. They were like, we need to change the way that we've been living, and we need to make some commitments to God about how we're going to live, and um, these were the three commitments they made. Um, their three commitments were, uh, were theirs to make. Um, I don't know if they necessarily carry over perfectly to us, but here they are. Um, this is in chapter 10, by the way. Um, they promised to, to not marry people from other nations around them who worshipped other gods. Um, they have a long history of having gotten wrapped up in idolatry when they did this, and so they, they said, we, know, we need to dedicate ourselves to the Lord fully, and our marriages are going to reflect that. Um, if you want to talk more about that, I'd love to do that one-on-one. -on -one. I'm not going to wade into that on this sermon. Um, otherwise, we're going to have like four sermons, and you guys aren't going to get out of here until like noon. So, um, <coughs> the other two vows that they made, one was to not trade on the Sabbath. They go, we're not going to have the marketplace open on the Sabbath. We're just not going to do that. We're going to dedicate that time to God. We're going to set aside time in our life for God. And then the last one was that they were going to give regularly. They were going to provide for the worship at the temple. They weren't going to neglect the temple. Um, and it kind of brings up this idea of, of pledges or promises or vows. And I think that these moments of clarity that we have where we go, something's off in our lives. We need to go in a better direction. 
often come with sort of this thing of like, well, I need to do this. And so we make a vow. We go, I, I'm going to do this. I want to head in this direction. And um, as rare as those moments of clarity are, what's, what's interesting to me is I think it's even harder to have that clarity lead to long-lasting change. There's something in us um, that likes to go back to the default that we've had. Um, I kind of wish, in some ways, like my idealistic, utopian self, wishes that Nehemiah ended right there and like the people recommitted themselves to God and everybody lived happily ever after. Yay. Um, but that's not how it ends. And one of the things I love about Scripture is that it's incredibly honest. <laughs> Um, it's honest about who God is and it's honest about who we are and what that dialogue looks like and, um, and it doesn't end there instead it ends in chapter 13 and in the meantime Nehemiah um, after getting all this stuff going has to get back to work he was on vacation doing all this he heads back to his job and um, works there for a while and then he goes you know what I have some time built up I need to ask the king if I can have another break to go check on how things have gone so he decides to go back, and when he goes back, um, he finds that the people haven't kept a single one of those three promises that they intended to keep. Um, and so unfolds chapter 13, which is beautiful for us, because it gives us a tip on how we can actually take intentions and make them into life rhythms. How can we actually make lasting change in our life from the good intentions we have? So, we're going to dive into their commitments, and we're going to see how Nehemiah deals with them, and hopefully it will lead us to somewhere good. So, um, the first one was uh, the commitment um, to the temple. So, let me just read for you uh, Nehemiah 13, 4 through 7. It says this, Before this, Eliashib, who was the priest had, that had been put in charge of the storerooms of the house of our God, he was closely associated with Tobiah. And he had provided him with a large room, formerly used to store grain offerings and incense and temple articles, and also the tithes of grain and new wine and oil prescribed for the Levites, singers, and gatekeepers, as well as the contributions for the priest. But while all this was going on, I was not in Jerusalem, for in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, I had returned to the king. And sometime later, I asked his permission and came back to Jerusalem, and here I learned about the evil thing Eliashev did in providing Tobiah a room in the courts of the house of God. So, um, who is Tobiah? Well, Tobiah has popped up again and again in our story. He is one of the three guys who has resisted this rebuilding of Jerusalem at every turn. Um, and uh, I, I just want to read for you the, how their, their relationship with Tobiah started. Um, but when Sembalat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite official, and Geshem the Arab heard about this, they mocked us and they ridiculed us and said, What are you doing rebuilding this wall? Are you rebelling against the king? And I answered them by saying, The God of heaven will give us success. We're his servants and we'll start rebuilding. But as for you, you have no right. You have no share in Jerusalem or any claim or any historic right to any of it. They had fought against them, they had attacked them as they were rebuilding, and they were not for this process. But then when it was finally done, the walls are up, uh, this guy has a lot of stuff, and he calls his old buddy who happens to be in charge of the storerooms and goes, hey, I know you haven't filled them up yet, so is there any chance that you might have some storage space that we could possibly use? And the guy's like, well, you're an old family friend, and yeah, we haven't really filled that room up yet. And so, I guess you can use some of it. Um, and what's interesting is that was the space that was set apart for holy things. It was set apart for um, something good for the people's sake. Um, and it gets misused. Um, do you have a junk drawer in your house? <laughs> yeah? You know, or maybe a junk room. I used yeah. to have a junk room in my house. Like, literally, don't go in the deep back room of the house because that's where stuff just gets tossed. And... Um, that's what happened. Um, stuff just got tossed. And um, the rut and the default of going, well, I guess this thing was supposed to be for holy use, but we're not going to do that. We're just going to use it for whatever. Um, sort of crept back into their lives. Um, so let me read for you how Nehemiah responds. Um, 
He says, uh, I was greatly displeased. I threw all of Tobiah's household goods out of those rooms. I gave order to purify the rooms. And then I put back into them the equipment of the house of God and the grain offerings and the incense. Um, he cleared the space, he dedicated the space, and then he put back what needs to be in there um, for good uses. And um, one of the beautiful things that he did in my mind is he filled the empty space. I don't know if they got that space going very well in the first place, they probably didn't. Um, but he fills this empty space that should have been used for good with something um, good instead, instead of just letting it go to its default. And um, empty space, it's not the purposeful spaces of our life, I think, that lead us into struggles. It's not when you go, I want to do something, I'm going to choose something to do that's just deliberately destructive to myself. I don't think that's how most of us function. I think it's actually the space that we go, eh, I don't know. And it sort of like becomes something. For me, um, let me tell you about one of my spaces that I find myself on occasion. Um, when I have a hard interaction or I say something stupid or I don't feel like church went well or something like that, sometimes I will go home and um, I will start to slide into a place I call my cave. And it's like this depressed space of like, man, I'm worthless. I can't do anything right. And um, I start to go into this cave. And... Um, for any of you that experience me in my cave, I don't really want to come out. Like, what I want to do is sit in there alone and then rehash the thing so that it can get bigger and bigger and bigger and figure out all the ways that I'm a mess. Um, and one of the beautiful things that happens is every now and then somebody says, you know what, let's go do something. And we go do something that's worth doing, that has some element of God's goodness and life in it. Um, let's go do something worth doing. And it pulls me right out of the cave. Um, let me give you another example. Um, spaces. So, um, shoot, I didn't clear this with Christina ahead of time, so I might hear about stuff. Anyway, we have this weird dynamic, right? <coughs> we had this weird dynamic where I would try to do something and it wouldn't come off right. Um, and then I would try to explain to her why I did what I did and how it was the right thing to do. Of course, because I'm going to make sense to her and she's going to be like, oh, I was so clueless to see what you were trying to do. Um, no, Christina goes, well, here's what you actually did and here's what that said to me. And she begins to explain why she reacted the way she did. And then I start to explain again why my intentions were so, so very good. Um, and we go back and forth. So eventually, um, in one of our times where we went to marriage counseling, the guy's like, you guys got to stop doing that. Now, if he had stopped there and just said, stop doing this. Don't do what's not working. And then said, great, pay me, you're out of here. That would not have been very helpful. Um, just leaving something blank saying, I'm not going to do something. I'm not going to do something. If I'm like, I'm not going to get mad at my boss. I'm not going to get mad at my boss. I'm not going to get mad at my boss. Um, that's not actually helpful. But taking away the negative, putting something good in there, and he goes, how about you try saying what you really feel towards the other person and then seeing how that goes. So I go, Christina, I really love you and I was trying to help you. How can I do that? And all of a sudden, nobody's defensive. It's a beautiful thing because all that guy did was say, clear out what's not working, put something good in its place, and see how it goes. Um, it's a beautiful thing to clear out spaces, put something good in them, and then see how it goes. Uh, and that's what uh, Nehemiah did. It reminds me of a story that Jesus told. Uh, at first, it's like a weird story. It's in the Sermon on the Mount, and I go, what is this doing here? It's a couple verses, and I would just wing over it. And then it kept coming up for me. I want to read it for you. It says, when an impure spirit comes out of a person, it goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it. And then it says, I'm going to return to the house that I left. Um, does that ever happen for you? you? Clear something messy out of your life. You think you're making headway, and all of a sudden it's back. Hanging out there um, it says, when it arrives, it finds the house swept clean, empty, and put in order. 
Um, and then it goes and it takes seven other spirits, more wicked than itself, and says, hey, you guys should come live here too. <laughs> and then the final condition of the person is worse off than the first. Um, Emptying space doesn't actually help us. But if the space is full, there's no room. Um, now, I am not encouraging us to have every second of our lives so full that we can barely breathe, and that way we can't ever make a misstep. Um, it doesn't work that way, and rest is crucial, um, as we'll get into the next commitment, which was seventh. Um, and being still before God and having emptiness is an empty space to just um, focus is a beautiful thing. Um, but just saying I'm not going to do something doesn't work. Putting good things in does. Genesis 1, the creation of the world story. The first thing that it says about the world was it was empty, formless, and void. It was chaos. Um, and then God saw, and he began to put things in. And each thing he puts in, he says, you know what? This is good. I'm going to make some light. That's good. I'm going to fill it with bushes. That's good. We're going to have animals, too. Those are good. And as good stuff keeps piling in, good things form, not space for the brokenness. Um, so this first key in heading in the right direction and actually having it become something, fill the empty spaces with good things. Um, summer is a chill time. We're not going to over-program the church. I hope that in the midst of whatever sort of summer break you're having, you can fill it with good things. Um, I think it'll serve us really well if we can do that. All right, second part of it is, uh, what was the temple supposed to be filled with? What is this empty room supposed to be filled with? Um, it says, actually, 13, 10 through 14. I also learned that the portions assigned to the Levites haven't been given to them, and that all the Levites and singers responsible for the service had decided to go back to their own fields. And so I rebuked the officials and asked them, why is the house of God being neglected? And then I called them together and stationed them at their post in all Judah, brought the ties of grain and new wine and oil to the storerooms. Um, I put Shemaliah, or Shalemiah, the priest, Zadok the scribe, and the Levite named Padiah in charge of the storerooms and made the canon, son of Zucher, the son of Mataniah, their assistant, because these men were considered trustworthy. They were made responsible for distributing the supplies to their brothers. Remember me for this, O oh my God. Do not blot out what I have done what I have so faithfully done for the house of my God and its services. Um, so, um, I'm so glad we already took the offering, because this passage seems to be talking about, like, oh, well, the people weren't giving, so the services didn't happen and all of that. That's not, it's not a fundraising <laughs> scripture. Um, when the offering stopped, the ministers went back to their other work. Um, and... Um, <clears throat> It brings up a principle, and, it, and it's one that's come up again and again, and that is, um, I like to call it starve the monster. Um, what we feed in our lives, what we give our time and attention and um, our talents and our resources to, will stick around in our life. And what we don't have time for, what we say no to, um, eventually won't. Um, so the harsh reality that I keep coming to when, when friends ask me if they want to do something, and I go, yeah, I'm not really available, I'm kind of busy, and then they ask me again, and then they ask me again, and eventually, like usually I think it's like three times. After at some point they go, oh, why bother ask Chris anymore? He's probably gonna say no, he obviously doesn't want to do this. Um, and on the other hand, if I go, man, I haven't heard from that person in a while, and I go, you know what, you're important to me, I really want to spend time with you. Let's get some on the calendar. All of a sudden, that can start to come back to our lives. Um, Facebook, man, I'm addicted. It's horrible. Yeah, I'm like scrolling through my feed, seeing things, and I love to know what's going on in people's lives. It's kind of how I'm wired. So I'm scrolling through my things, and then I find myself at dinner with Christina, and she's like, why are you looking down past the table? And I'm like scrolling through my feed while I have dinner with my wife. Um, Maybe it's time for me to start Facebook a little bit at that point. Um, I need to not pay attention to it. Um, this presidency has been filled with headlines every single day. I could easily, easily get sucked into all of my feelings about how the country is going. And I would not have time and attention for the things that God wants me to do in my life. So I have to decide, what am I going to start? What am I going to feed? Um, and then there's this beautiful prayer. God, remember me. Um, 
Because really, at the end of the day, um, I don't know how many things I've started and not gotten to, um, but I really need God's help if I'm going to turn a good intention into a lasting change in my life. Um, I'm done thinking that I can do it all myself. So, um, second promise, uh, the trading on the Sabbath. You know, let me read 13, 15 through 22, and then um, and we'll wrap up. In those days I saw men in Judah treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in grain and loading it on donkeys together with wine and grapes and figs and all other kinds of loads. And they were bringing all these things into Jerusalem on the Sabbath. And therefore I warned them against selling the food that day. And then men from Tyre, who also lived in Jerusalem, were bringing in fish and all kinds of merchandise and selling them in Jerusalem on the Sabbath to the people of Judah. And I rebuked the nobles of Judah and said to them, What is this wicked thing that you're doing? desecrating the Sabbath day. Didn't your forefathers do the same thing so that our God brought all of this calamity upon us and upon the city? And now you're stirring up wrath against Israel by desecrating the Sabbath. And when the evening shadows fell on the gates of Jerusalem before the Sabbath, I ordered that the doors be shut and not opened until the Sabbath was over. And I stationed some of my own men at the gates so that no load could get brought in on the Sabbath day. And once or twice the merchants and sellers of all kinds of goods spent the night outside Jerusalem. And I warned them and said, Why are you spending the night by the wall? If you do this again, I'm going to lay hands on you. And from that time on, they no longer came to the Sabbath, came on the Sabbath. And then I commanded the Levites to purify themselves and go guard the gates in order to keep the Sabbath day holy. Remember me for this also, my God, and show mercy to me according to your great love. Um, I want to start with the people from Tyre. They are, um, they're not God followers. They're not uh, people who would think anything special of the Sabbath. They are um, wanting to come and do their trade in Jerusalem like they always do. Um, to them, one day is just as good as any other. And so they show up, they set up their stands, and, I, and I'm picturing the people of Jerusalem, and they're walking along, and they're like, I'm on my way to the temple. I'm going to have a day where I'm going to set apart some time for God. I'm going to dedicate myself to this. That is a really good deal. Half <laughs> off, man. <laughs> um, it's okay if I'm a little bit late. Understandable. Uh, but the trick for them was that um, they weren't able to have the market going and focus on God at the same time. They'd known this in 10 when they made the commitment. Um, so. Nehemiah comes in and says, we need to set up some healthy boundaries. The market's not going to be open on Sunday anymore, or on Saturday for them. The market's not going to be open on Saturday. We can't do it until we get this going in its place. Um, it's a beautiful thing to realize that you can't do some things and then set up a healthy boundary against it. Um, we are not supposed to be capable of doing all things ourselves. Um, Christina knows that I am horrible with salespeople. If you are a salesperson, try to catch me alone because I will end up buying whatever it is that you're selling. I'm such a people pleaser that they're like looking at me and trying to explain to me how good their product is. And I'm all I'm thinking is, I really want to make your day. And so, um, I want to say yes. Uh, and um, so we kind of made a deal that salespeople get to talk to both of us. Um, and it was really cool. Last week we had some friends we had a friend over, and um, so folks came to the door, and they were looking for a donation for something very good. And Christina came in and goes, hey, I don't mean to interrupt you, but um, this is going on. I want to do something to donate towards it. Is that okay? How much do you think we should do? We had a little mini tiny conversation, but it was accountability for each other. And um, with major purchases, it's got to be 24 hours. That's our boundaries. Um, and those boundaries allow me, when I'm talking to that salesperson, to go, you know what, my wife's not here, I, I, I can't say yes, because we decided that I'm not allowed to make these decisions. <laughs> <laughs> it's just bad. No joke, thousands of dollars for new windows, it's all on me. <laughs> yeah, so it's a healthy boundary. Um, I don't know if you know about the study, I, it's been brought up a number of times, but there's a study that was done on playgrounds with fences and playgrounds that don't have fences. Um, and the idea was that if you don't put up fences, 
the kids will be able to explore more and they'll learn more and they'll grow more and um, or you can put up a fence. And what they found was that the places that were fenced, the kids could go all the way to the edge and play all they wanted. They knew they were safe. The kids that didn't have the boundary, the fence that showed them what's worth doing and what's not, um, they kind of huddled near the school and played. But they weren't sure where they could go and where they could, that could lead to trouble or they would get in trouble. And so um, this healthy boundary actually just walls off um, spaces that we don't want to go and do um, but boundaries also create more space for us. Because then we go, no, this is what I do. This is how far I can go in these spaces. Um, and when the people of Jerusalem finally had this wall built, they began to thrive. They had a boundary that set them into good spaces. Um, it's a beautiful thing. And then there's this prayer again. Um, verse 22, remember me for this. And then there's this part, it's cool. Um, Show me mercy according to your unfailing love. Nehemiah is an incredibly powerful dude. He is coming through. He is making reforms. He has helped build this wall. Um, it would be easy for Nehemiah to go, man, I am capable not only of managing myself well, but managing everybody else. And yet in his prayer, he says, remember me, God. Show me mercy. What is mercy? Mercy is grace that we don't deserve. I don't deserve your goodness, but God, show me mercy and do it because, why? Not because I've done a whole bunch of stuff really, really well. Do it because you love. You want what's best for me, so please, God, out of your mercy, remember me. Um, that is the most powerful thing that I think we can do if we want to have a life that goes forward in a good direction is to say, you know what, I know that there's a God who gives a rip about me, who loves me, who laid down his life for me, cares about me that much that he wants to give me life, and so I'm going to count on him and his grace and his mercy. And I'll bring what I can bring to the table, but we'll see. But I'll need God's help. Um, that's what we got. Um, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation has seized you except what is common to man. That means whatever we go through, people have gone through before. Uh, and then it says this, God is faithful. He's not going to let us get tempted beyond what we can bear. Uh, <clears throat> so what we're facing is, is what we can handle with this help. And then it says this, and when you're tempted, he's going to provide a way out for you so that you can stand up under it. Uh, God is with us and wanting to work in us, to provide for us, to give us the power and the strength and the patience and the kindness and the goodness and even the intentions to be able to do what's going to lead to life. Um, I don't know what your failures and ruts look like. Um, I know what mine look like sometimes. And I would trade any of them um, to be in better spaces and to not be better around me. I want to have the abundant life that Jesus can So this prayer, God, remember me, have mercy on me out of your unfailing love, is so beautiful. So this week, um, this month, this year, may you find yourself on, on better pathways, pathways that lead to life um, because of the God who loves you um, and because of simple things like starving monsters and feeding good things and clearing out spaces and putting good stuff there. That's my prayer. So let's pray. God, thanks for Nehemiah. Thanks for this book, um, for what it is that he built in Jerusalem, but more importantly, for the fact that you want to build good things into our lives and that you do so out of your great love. Um, help us to be people who know where to put up the boundaries for our lives, people who can clear out spaces and put good things in their places. God, we need you. We love you. And um, it's amazing that you love us and care for us so well.